Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Thunder and TK. Today, I want to know, is church relevant or useful today? Dr. Thunder, what's going on, my brother? How's it going today? It's all right. It's all right. Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, well I'm I, excited, man, because, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But, but here are some thoughts on this. Uh, I think one of well, the well, reasons. Let me give our audience a little bit of context real quick. I'm, I'm sorry, really quickly. Let me give a little bit of context. You and I appeared on a panel discussion. Uh, about a, a little more than a week ago. The YouTuber's name is O'Shea Duke Jackson. He's a prominent voice in what's known as the Black Manosphere. Uh, when I told one of my buddies about this, he says, what is the Manosphere, let alone the Black one? The Manosphere refers to a body of work consisting of podcasts, YouTube videos, articles, and so on, sometimes referred to as the Red Pill community, but it focuses a lot on men's issues, men's mental health, men's dating life, all those sorts of things. And the focus is to be a voice for men, helping men become better. And um, O'Shea Duke Jackson is is a pretty popular guy. And he had a panel discussion that, that you convinced him to assemble. It had the two of us, a couple of ministers and a couple of pastors. And it was about why African-American men are leaving the black church. And we all kind of weighed in on why that's happening. And I encourage anyone to go check out that discussion. I think it was very interesting. You can find it on YouTube, O'Shea Duke Jackson, Why African-American Men Are Leaving the Black Church. It inspired me, however, to talk about this in a broader way that extends beyond just men and just black churches. Because you and I both identify with the experience of growing up in church. But I feel that when conversations about spirituality are being had today, there's a kind of defensiveness around bringing up the church when people are having discussions on meditation or a life of faith or a life of creativity. It seems like you can talk about anything from any perspective, but when you talk about the church's perspective, you run up against resistance that many people have been wounded by the church. They've been disappointed so deeply by the church. And there's a kind of openness, if you will, towards maybe Eastern religions or Eastern philosophies, whereas there's a kind of a sense of being hurt or even perhaps traumatized by churches. And so I'd like to know from you, man, I just, I just have really two questions I want to discuss today, and we're going to be shorter than we usually are. And the first question is, why are people leaving the church? I love to hear your, your take on that. And, and why are they preferring to go to other places, whether it's the Manosphere, Eastern religion, to get their satisfaction from spirituality. Yeah. So, uh, I think in the West, uh, churches, a lot of churches have embraced this sort of mega church pop Christianity sort of format. And the problem with, uh, popularity is that it is transient. It's not going to last. So what that causes is that you have to run around chasing the flavor of the month. Now, when society is moving in a particular direction, um, AKA, uh, you know, in many, in many respects, the sort of influence of feminism and how that has totally changed so many dynamics. Uh, so when what is appropriate in culture or what is considered the sort of Overton window in the general culture is different than sort of historical, uh, you know, truths about Christianity, you, you end up with, with a rub there and you, your your sort of window keeps getting smaller and smaller and this sort of lowest common denominator becomes a smaller and smaller collection of things so i think that creates a a built-in challenge and problem um now i said you know before you know i i don't really i i i don't know exactly why but 
this is that that's one of my thoughts on it. Another one of my thoughts is that as men, uh, because of this sort of influence of uh, pop culture and in particular feminism on the church, um, it becomes less and less catered to and speaking on positive masculinity and things that men are going to be interested in. So I think ultimately what's going to happen and what has started happening already is not just men, but I think women too will leave the church because in general, wherever men go, that's where women want to go. And this is actually a dynamic that uh, Pastor Joel Brooks, he was one of the people that was on the panel with us, that he mentioned. He said when he inherited his church, it was almost all women. And he chart, he said, okay, we're going to focus on the men. You know, and he had to take some flack for that, but he said, we're going to focus on the men. And he got his congregation to a 50-50 congregation. And this is such a big <clears throat> deal, especially in the black community, that there was some media coverage associated with that. Right now, what happens is because there are 50 percent men in this church, then the women started to rush in. And so that it started to change that dynamic again. So wherever the men are, the women, they're going to also want to be there. So as the men have vacated and it has left, uh, especially in black churches, congregations full of, of women and in particular single mothers, um, you know, pretty soon women are going to be like, well, why am I? Why am I going here? There's no chance of me meeting a husband here because there's, <laughs> there's no guys here. So, yeah, those are a couple of the uh, of these sort of practical challenges. One thing I'll throw in there is I think a lack of focus on what it means to live a purposeful life. I think when you when you look at the biblical concept of sin, you cannot get an accurate understanding of that if you divorce it from the biblical concept of purpose. In other words, the, the biblical narrative, the cosmic drama does not begin with the idea of sin. It begins with the idea of creation and creativity. It begins with the idea of let there be light and the idea of let us create them in our likeness and our image and take, you know, take dominion, subdue the earth, take dominion. And sin is so important as an idea or as a concept precisely because it works against the purpose for which we were created. And when you separate the idea of sin from the idea of purpose, what you get is this moralistic list of do's and don'ts without any point of reference. And then you end up having a religion that idolizes sin, a religion that focuses on making people feel guilty for doing what is wrong or trying to get people to feel motivated to do what is right without any understanding of the broader context that gives meaning to the idea of righteousness. Righteousness mm -hmm. has nothing to do with obeying a set of laws that have nothing to do with our design. The analogy that I like to use is, let's say you have a car. If you want that car to function properly, there are certain things that you have to do, like check and change the oil periodically. You have to put fuel in the car. Now imagine if one day you see someone getting ready to put orange juice in the gas tank and you said, no, 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 man, don't do that. That's bad. That's a terrible idea. Don't put orange juice in the gas tank. Number one, if a person is trying to do that, you can assume that somewhere along the, the way, they've accepted a kind of distorted understanding of what a car is for. And when you tell them, don't put orange juice in the, in the gas tank, you're not saying that arbitrarily. You're not saying that because you don't want to encourage an environment of creativity. You're not saying that because you dislike them. You're saying that because you understand something true about the design and purpose of a car and what that car needs in order to optimally function. And when a person understands those things, they have the motivation to not put orange juice in the gas tank. 
but it's not a motivation that comes from discipline. It's a motivation that comes from being grounded in an understanding of what is the car for? And I think there has been less talk on what are human beings for? What are we created for? And a lot of talk on, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And I think people have built into human nature this desire to be creative, this desire to be great, not necessarily in terms limited to being a millionaire, but a desire to be great in their own unique way because God has put gifts in each of us and has given us as a purpose to dominate in the area of our gifting, not to dominate human beings, but to dominate the earth in the sense that we shine, we shine as we allow God's brilliance to express itself through us in a unique individualized way. And anytime you disconnect from that message, you disconnect from humanity. You disconnect from what God has put in the heart of every person. And I think when we look at where people go, they're going to places that are speaking to that part of them. They're going to places that speak about possibility, that speak about power, that speak about living a life of purpose. And people just aren't interested in being told, hey, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you deny the concept of sin. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you get wishy-washy about it and treat it like it's unimportant, but you resist the temptation to make a God out of sin by taking it and putting it in its proper context. We are not just saved from sin. We are saved for a life of purpose. That is the abundant life that I believe Jesus spoke of when he said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so my, my take on why so many people dismiss the church as having anything meaningful to say about spirituality is because in many ways, churches have opted out of discussions on spirituality and has made everything about sin management, sin tracking, or sin forgiveness. And hey, when people embrace that message, the church is filled with lots of people that have embraced that message. They accept the reality of sin. They accept forgiveness from sin. But all right, now, now that we've gotten these people to accept the idea of the penalty of sin and the gospel's message about redemption, what about the power of it? What about the perspectives of it? How do we transcend that in order to live lives that are full and that are free in the way that God intended? I think leaving that out neutralizes the church's entire message. Yeah, it's interesting because I think you see this sort of going both directions. You see some churches sort of focusing on the sin thing, and then some churches saying, you know what, well, we're just not going to talk about sin at all. Um, and, um, and that provides a different set of problems, but I, th I think just as profound, um, you know, you, you, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, one of the, one of the primary issues too is, you, you know, anything that doesn't sort of focus on fostering positive relationships between men and women is going to be problematic if you if you are sort of in the tank for one over the other that's going to seek to alienate the other group and they're going to say i don't want to do this anymore mm -hmm. um and then as that becomes uh more of a constant i mean men men are stoic tend to be stoic and we tend to, you know, just take it, you know, take it how it comes. Uh, a lot often is the case that we don't voice our our grievances. Uh, we will just say, hey, you know, this is just part of being a man. Hey, you know, man up, you know, take it on the chin, take it in stride. And then on top of that, men have not really had the sort of lexicon, uh, you know, the language to discuss some of these kinds of issues that are uh, ubiquitous mm -hmm. in the black manosphere. Uh, it wasn't until fairly recently that those terms were sort of codified um, and that we could, you know, and, and that there was a community that was large enough uh, for us to be able to have these discussions in a frank manner with other folks that have gone through the same things and that are not afraid 
of expressing those things uh, because of the sort of social climate. I think one thing that's happened over the last several months due to the pandemic is it's created a, uh, I mean, we're in a situation now where, where there's, you can actually say certain things that you could not say just months prior. Um, and I think the sort of meteoric rise of Kevin Samuels is evidence, is evidence of that. Yeah, man, uh, two things. It's interesting how you're talking about the things that are being talked about in the manosphere, because I think about a topic like sexuality, for instance. For the most part, when sexuality gets discussed in churches, if it gets discussed at all, it's talked about from the vantage point of sin and things that one should not do. And you hear very few discussions on what a healthy sexuality could look like, right? Like, like, like this idea that sexuality is something that is divine and comes from God. And it is possible for one to have a relationship to their own sexuality that goes beyond repression, suppression and constraint. And what does that look like? I don't I don't really know if that discussion's happening, right? But in the manosphere, there there are at least multiple opinions about that aspect of things that get talked about. So, for instance, I think it's very fascinating, very fascinating that the whole no fat movement is a conversation that's happening outside of church, and it is absolutely amazing that for years, churches have been preaching about abstinence and that message gets resistant, resisted. And then the manosphere essentially talks about a similar concept. And the whole, I, I, don't, I won't call it war against, but there's a lot of education that's come from the manosphere about pornography, destroying the mind, destroying the soul and, 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 and robbing man of potential. And people are embracing that message with excitement and the reason why is because they're not just talking about it from the angle of, hey, this is bad, don't do it. They're saying, hey, look, you have powerful creative energy, man. And when you waste it on this, here's what it keeps you from discovering about yourself. Here's how it's yep. keeping you from succeeding. Yep, yep. And, you know, th this is interesting because all of this stuff is uh, – inexorably connected, right? It's, it's, it's part of the same stuff. And that is, so you have this, uh, and this is uh, pretty constantly referenced in, in the manosphere, this sort of 2080 principle. And many have suggested that this is more of like a 1090 principle, right? And that is that 10, maybe 15, maybe 20% of the men are sleeping with 80% or 90% of the women. And certainly the case is true that the 80 to 90% of women, they definitely, 100% of women actually, they want the top 5, 10, 15% of men. All right. And then because of social media and because of dating apps and how they definitely favor women, they actually have access. <laughs> they actually have access to these men. Right. Now, these men have no incentive to com commit to anyone because they have access to 80 to 90 percent of men. But let's look at what that does to the men, to the 80 to 90 percent of men. So um, 80 to 90 percent of men have very little interaction with the kind of women that they want. Well, almost none. And then almost no interaction, positive interaction at all with women. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> so you need something in place that will pacify that huge number of men. And what is that? It's pornography. Okay. So this, ba this sort of beta fies all of these guys, because if you can get it there, you're not going to probably do what's necessary to actually get into a real relationship with a woman. All right. So this has become a huge, huge problem, all created by the sort of, um, you know, liberation of, you know, certain faculties, uh, 
uh, you know, it's 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 created a situation where a uh, disproportionate number of the men have access to all of the women, <laughs> you know, and that seems to be the exact opposite of probably what was intended by this. But now that it is this way, there's no real quick fix for this, this problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think people in the manosphere, they're like, you know what, we see what's happening now. We see that part of the reason why a lot of these guys are not able to get these relationships with women that they want is because they're being totally pacified. They're being totally, totally pacified by pornography. And it's, uh, it's, it's tough because I, I, you know, I can't think of a single person that I know, single man that I, that I know that hasn't had some sort of dealing with this and how addicting, you know, that, that is. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Solomon Jones, uh, Solo TV 84, I interviewed him on my conversations with Dr. Thunder series. He uh, talks about no fab. He talks about it a lot. And he talks about this sort of, he talks about spirituality and he talks about, he's also actually been talking about semen retention, which is different than no fab. And he claims that because of that, it has boosted a certain energy in himself and it makes him more, uh, you know, assertive, more, you know, more of a go getter, more of, you know, getting out there and making stuff happen, more about getting his money right, getting his life right, getting all this other stuff together with that as a as a pacification. And just indulging in that, what it does is it just makes you just, oh, hey, I'm, I'm straight. I'll just play video games like this. I don't need to interact with anybody else anyway. So, so you need something like that, a big pacifier like that, to pacify such a huge percentage of the population that is not having the kind of interactions that they want with the opposite sex. You know, I want to say something about this pacification thing, because I think you're absolutely right. And... It's so much more than that, because it is not merely the case that by having this substitute for the real scenario, you are getting a need met in an artificial way. It's it's much worse. It's you are creating the illusion of having that need met in it's a like way that is distort. Yeah, in a way in a way that distorts your perception of reality. So it's similar to the way that video games, and this doesn't mean video games are bad, okay? But it's similar to the way that a video game can give you the sensation at a superficial level of success because you conquered the game, you beat the final boss. And, and, and it can be hard for the brain to detect the difference between that and real success. I remember Derek Sivers had a, an article called Guitar Hero or Guitar Hero. And he was talking about the phenomenon of people dedicating hours upon hours upon hours developing a non-transferable skill that's going to immediately expire as soon as this game ceases to be possible and he was making the case for why actually mastering something like a real guitar will give you a greater long-run benefit because it's a transferable skill it's a skill that will always give you valuable always give you value but always be transferable to other things you want to become good at in life, like learning a new language or whatever it may be. And I think in a similar way, right is right for a reason. Reality is reality for a reason. And whenever we use artificial things to try to meet legitimate, genuine human needs and desires, we, we cause the relationship that we have with our own selves to be compromised. And, and and by the way, this segues way me into somebody that I've been thinking about a lot lately is uh, the impact of Jordan Peterson. And I know that I probably just triggered a thousand churchgoers and a thousand Christians by mentioning this man's name because so many people are mad at this cat. So many people, I, I never realized how many people are mad at Jordan Peterson, which is super interesting to me because I think he is single-handedly causing more non-churchgoers to become interested in philosophizing about Christianity, perhaps arguably more than most pastors or preachers today. 
and 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 I think there's something to be uh to to be learned from someone that's having conversations with people outside of churches about the Bible, about Jesus, and that's actually making people interested. I know so many people. I have so many students, for instance, who've embarked on projects like I'm going to read the Bible because Jordan Peterson did this Bible series that made me really interested. And I think something that he does very well, and he, he's still sorting out where he stands with the truth of Christianity, is that he contextualizes these ideas and understandings within the hero's journey, which is something that we all identify with, right? We all identify with having battles to fight, having potential to fulfill, and having some sense of being part of something that is larger than our individual lives. And he speaks to that. And to me, that offers some very encouraging evidence of the fact that the world is not lost, man. There are a lot of people that are really hungry to know who they are and know the meaning of their existence. And they are truly willing to listen to anyone that can communicate with empathy and with understanding and with the open-mindedness of someone that's not really threatened or defensive by the questions and doubts that you have, which is something that Jesus, you know, represented very well and probably doesn't get talked about enough. Like I can't think of any instances in the Bible where Jesus got super defensive or got his feelings hurt because someone doubted or because someone had a question, you know? Yeah, I think, I think, um, in this is, this is inter interesting because you hear Kevin Samuels mention Jordan Peterson pretty frequently. Um, you know, <laughs> You know, and I, I, maybe I'll take some heat for this, but in all the years I've been in church, there, I, I can't think of a single um, preacher or sermon that has had, you know, a tenth of the impact of what Jordan Peterson is doing. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just facts. It's, it's just true. This sort of culture changing potential, the, you know, actually reaching out to people that don't have anything to do with the church that, you know, had written it off, you know, that kind of impact, that kind of power, you know, I, I you know, I can't think of a single, you know, minister or, you know, that, that has had that kind of impact, that kind of wide ranging impact in the modern era. And then, uh, the other, uh, the other, uh, the other thing I was going to say is, I would argue also that what it is that Kevin Samuels is doing in the Black Manosphere, um, I would argue for the sake of the Black Church, I, I, I think it's more important than anything. <laughs> Again, I think it's more important. <laughs> it's more powerful than most of what's going on, you know, you know, coming from the pulpit in black churches, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but I, I think it's facts because he's focused on what? the most important relationship that you can have. And that is with, you know, a member of the opposite sex. I mean, it's the, it, you know, it's the very cornerstone of society. It's the thing that has been totally ignored and he's bringing to the forefront mm -hmm issues that men have that they have been uh unable to uh to to you know to mention on you know in that kind of platform and or you know that when they have mentioned things in the past but you know that they've been met with you know gaslighting frankly gaslighting i mean you see abba and preach you know they were talking about the the uh about red pill and although they admit, uh, they they said that you know they thought that the the analogy was was you know cringy or whatever, but that it was needed. And uh, they further went on to say that in the past, when you know they had bad experiences with women and like this, and they would try to mention it, that they would get gaslighted because it, they would act like oh that ain't nothing, or you know, or you're the only one, or this kind of thing. But uh, you know, I think that uh, I think men are starting to recognize the okie doke that that stuff is is phony baloney, and uh, you know that's why a lot of this material is having this kind of 
um, kind of reach and effect and impact. Yeah, it's interesting because there is an expectation that whether it's fair or not, whether people would consciously acknowledge or admit it or not, there is an expectation that men demonstrate a certain level of power and competence with handling emotional issues, right? As a man, when you, I'll give this example. Let's say you have a woman walking down the street and she's holding a bunch of books in her arms and she drops them and, and, and the books fall out, fall over. Nearly every man in sight is going to rush to help her out. If you are a guy and you do that, at least half the men are going to be like, will you get out of the way and get your stuff together? Right. And I don't think that's not even something that I resist. That's not something that I that I feel bitter about that I think is is necessarily bad. I think that exists for a reason. But what has decreased are practices, rituals that help men transition into becoming the kinds of adults that can effectively handle those sorts of realities, preparing men for that reality. And what right. you're seeing by a lot of the guys in the manosphere, if you look at the comments that Kevin Samuels gets, you look at the comments that Jordan Peterson gets, you see so many young guys saying things like, you're like the cool uncle I never had. You're like the father that I never had. It's not that the expectations on being a man are too great. It's that the knowledge of how to become a man has is not being taught. And it, it's just sort of treated as, oh, when you get to a certain age, you will know how to provide for yourself. You will know how to stand up for yourself. You will know how to say what's on your mind. You will know how to deal with rejection. And that stuff isn't automatic at all. But here's my question for you, man, because I know we got to wrap up soon. Why is it so hard for churches to, and, I, and my question assumes that it is, for churches to look at people that are being really effective in this way and to humbly learn from them. I, I think for a lot of people, it feels like a big compromise, right? It, it feels like, oh no, because Jordan Peterson doesn't believe in the, the physical resurrection of Jesus and he's not technically a Christian yet. Uh, and because some of these guys in the manosphere are not Christian, if I try to learn from their effectiveness, that will be the equivalent of me compromising my message for the sake of just reaching people. What, what do you have to say to that concern? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I think the, the problem was, was caused, you know, when I was presenting before, one of the issues being, you know, the sort of mega church, the sort of pop culture, you know, the sort of trendy Christianity, the, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've heard, I've, I've heard, you know, churches mention terms like trending younger, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, uh, you know, so, so you, you kind of set up this problem yourself and you're, but you were following the wrong influences, right? You were following things that, uh, were at best, going to make you temporarily relevant, but had a significant risk of, of, uh, you know, shooting you in the foot with respect to longevity. Okay. So you, you, you already made that mistake. So I think the way to look at this is to say, okay, why is Jordan, what is relevant about him? What is relevant about Kevin? What, what is, what is relevant and maybe to look at it and say, okay, what things are, are not an issue of trendiness and what is the substance that's, that's dealing mm -hmm. with and try to find a way to make a connection with, I think things that are older, wiser, have a longer, you know, a longer tenure, you know, in Christianity and see if you can make a connection. I think it's super easy 
to find those things that are in common. I think the reason that they are effective is because of their uh, their their sort of Christian sensibilities. I think it's why they are effective. So, you know, that's, yeah. You know, it's interesting. That last sentence you said, one of the reasons why they're so effective is because of Christian sensibilities. One of the most fascinating observations to me is that what counts as a Christian sensibility is so skewed that when Christians see an example of Christian sensibility making a positive impact on the world, they often call it something else and then reject it, right? So the idea that being firm is a Christian sensibility, the idea that being, the, the idea of, of speaking a message of truth, even if it causes someone to be mad at you and walk away. I, I think a lot of people have in their minds that Jesus was a politically correct guy. And, and I suppose it's easy to walk away with that impression if you don't read the Bible. <laughs> but like when you read the Bible, Jesus is the complete opposite of a politically correct person. And, and he was not liked by everyone. You know, I always laugh when people say things like, be like Jesus. His message was universal. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding no, me? He, he was uh, very polemic. Yeah, he was very polemic. Polemic. I mean, uh, what was it? He came with as a sword, dividing families. You know, uh, <laughs> he, he was very. He, he didn't care about uh, politically correct stuff. He was not trying to stay in the Overton window. You know, matter of fact, the 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 con concept of stop simping in in you know that whole concept. That's actually a Christian conception. That's actually laid out very, very clearly, very clearly. Uh, um, I think it, what is it? it's Jesus's words. He says, don't, you know, cast your pearl before swine. Right. Don't cast your pearls before swine because they're not going to recognize the, the, the value. They're not going to recognize that. And then also they're going to try to use that against you. They will weaponize your, your gift against you right that's right in the, that's that's right in there and if you look at what happens to people when they when they subdue their own value self-deprecate their own value and pedestalize uh, women right that that's 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 one of the the aspects of that that gets pressed but that that manifests all throughout right say if you have a job and <laughs> you're constantly doing that same thing, right? Pedestalizing mm -hmm. everything else, subduing your own worth, right? That that's not going to be a positive. It's not going to be a positive thing. So that that whole conception, and you know, on O'Shea's panel, I I think I said that Adam was the first simp, um, <laughs> as an Adam and Eve. <laughs> so this is a, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you know, u ubiquitous and long existing issue. I think it's just sort of achieved sort of epidemic proportions. I really have to go. <laughs> all right, shout out to the people who tuned in and shared all the thoughtful comments. Michelle, what is happening? Michelle Stamper, John, uh, I wanna say it's uh, uh, Lizak. Oh man, forgive me, forgive me brother John. But thanks for everybody that's tuned in that shared questions and comments. Uh, continue to share the questions and comments even after the live stream stops. I will come in and check them out. If there's anything you all want to hear us discuss in future episodes, don't hesitate to let us know. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to hit the subscribe to the channel button and leave a comment letting us know your thoughts because we believe that ideas or the discussion thereof is a community thing. And we like to engage people who not only think alike, but who think differently because that's what allows all of us to think better. All right, y'all, thanks for tuning in. Dr. Thunder, thanks for hanging out, man.